Are you out there somewhere, you motherless, motherless Brooklyn? It didn't make any sense to me till I heard it. I hope it now makes sense. Welcome. This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book. I watched a movie. If you didn't get it, we're doing Motherless Brooklyn, the film directed by Edward Norton, also the actor you might be aware of. The book is written by Jonathan Lethem, came out 20 years ago, won the National Books Critics Circle Award for Fiction, mm. and in 2000 won the Gold Dagger Award for Crime Fiction, so it was popping at the time. And Ed Norton was like, let me scoop this up and make this into a movie cut to 20 years later. I listened to the, the Joe Rogan interview with Ed Norton that, that just happened recently, and he said he read it uh, while he was actually filming uh, Fight Club. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, he was reading it right as it came out, which I thought was really fascinating. And he says he's been working with it ever since. I just love that he's been on it from the first get from the get go. He's a well read, which is so, which is so <laughs> not the case, you know, in most cases. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I listened to the audio book narrated by Jeffrey Cantor, which you should, if you are getting into this, watch the movie. If you want to read the book, I would say go with the audio book. So I'll post a link to the trailer in the show notes. But the main character has yeah, Tourette's. Yeah, why is that? Yeah. The main character has Tourette's. And so to read the book, you're reading all the jibber-jabber and his mental regressions and thoughts and chaos that's going on. But listening to the audio book, the narrator does an amazing job mm. of just hearing it. And it feels so much more natural and real. And he does all the other character voices and whatnot. But I mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. it's written in the first person. And so like, I feel like it would be so hard to read the gibberish or the strung together words or the repeating phrases that he, he he's compelled to say. Uh, I, I see. Yes. I think, yes, y you've painted that really well. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, th I could imagine that would be really challenging for, for a lot of people. And so I had no notion of reading the book because I just went straight to the audio book, but I'm like, this is probably better than reading it on the page because he does the dialogue and the back and forth and the oh, mental gymnastics of it all oh, that with like the sped up trying to get it out really fast. Oh man. You know. Oh, that sounds thing. cool. That yeah. sounds great. That's so special. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting uh, me yeah. and everyone know about that. Yeah, That's so go that. for that. And it's it's definitely one of the a true detective story though the book is set in the 90s when it came out and the movie uh, set in the 50s. Set in the 50s, which was a choice by Edward Norton. The last line of the book was very, very touching to me. It's kind of more of a bittersweet ending. We won't mm. go into all the details of the movie and the book, but it's it's a, a good line, which we'll get to at the very end, which I think also summarizes kind of what the movie is about as okay. well. Okay. But I'd like to go into the history. I looked up detective novels as a whole, because mm. we know some of the names. We know Sherlock Holmes and whatnot, but I wasn't right. as in this genre. And this book is a classic. This this is what this author is known for. This is what he loves. This is the research. There's references to other novels and detective stories in this book. So this is what this guy's all about. So he wrote a detective book set in the 90s mm -hmm. as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. So detective book set in the 90s. Yeah. Interesting. But he's all versed in this. But it's kind of, it feels like the old school, which is why Ed Norton was like, let's set it actually in the right. movie in the 50s. Because you can the, imagine, yes. you can imagine yes. it in your mind reading it. But then he's like, when you put it on the screen, it kind of feels hokey if they're all wearing fedoras and talking kind of old school Brooklyn and pretending to be a detective agency. Like it feels like you're making fun of that mm. when really in the book, it just feels natural because you imagine it in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's a weird mm -hmm. tonal thing, but yeah. So I wanted to know, well, what, what, how did detective stories fit in over time right. after I read this. Yeah, what would he have had to have kind of looked at and, and kind mm -hmm. of drawn from? Yeah. yeah, interesting. And Evan, I don't know if you know this, we actually have talked about this before in a previous episode. A tie-in? Which I don't oh, think... I love tie-ins. Yeah. The first detective story comes from The Thousand and One Nights, which we <gasps> No! <did. laughs> which yeah. We did an episode on Aladdin, so go back and listen to that. Yeah. We said, I don't know if you remember, we said that it also had the first zombie story and the first sci-fi yes. story. Yes. Yeah. And it's got Knocking the first- Knocking it out <laughs> of the park. Bow, 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 bow. It's got the first detective story, which is, you know, people uncovering clues and presenting evidence to catch a criminal and you figure out who did it at the end. Mm -hmm. That's the detective story. Oh, fa fabulous. Yeah. Fa yeah. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. But I was fascinated by how detective stories factor in across the world because a lot of times we just talk about 
the European, you know, that's all we are taught in school is what the British people were writing. But there was mm. so much other writing going on way before that that was detective fiction. So there's Chinese detective fiction, which comes about in the 1200s. And it's more like court cases where there's a judge, but there's hundreds of different characters. There's also a supernatural elements that was not popular in Europe at the time, like the ghosts. <laughs> of it the... was not popular. No. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, they did not want that at all. But the first European sensibility of a detective story was this thing called Das Fräulein von Scuderi. And it's an 18- 18... Just kidding. <laughs> German, 1819. This guy, E.T.A. Hoffman, one of his short stories is the basis for the Nutcracker, Tchaikovsky's musical. Oh. So he did that short story. And you then, dog. Yeah. He became the direct influence on Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue which then followed the series of the detective that's in that. Wouldn't you love to tout that? Yeah, yeah. I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hoffman. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> and then, of course, we have uh, Sherlock Holmes in 1887. And then uh, the period between World War I and World War II was the golden age of detective fiction, because we're always talking about golden ages yeah. of these different literary spans. Mostly women who were writing these, and they were mostly British women as oh. well. And the main, the main gal why is... Was, why, would, why would that be? Yeah, who, who's the main? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt No, no, flow, it's, but... it's good. Yeah, I was puzzling. I couldn't really find anything in, in what I was seeing about that. I just thought that was an interesting tidbit. It's fascinating, because then I think about the Nancy Drew episode mm -hmm. where we talked about... It was about, woman, yeah. Yeah, was, uh, that's, uh, that's, that rings interesting to me. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Agatha Christie. If you, She did Murder on Agatha. the Orient Express. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time of her death in 76, she was the best-selling novelist in history. Boom. That was what was going on in the 20s and 30s. Across the world, in Japan, this was huge as well. Whoa, detective really? stories. Yeah. The biggest guy doing it was Itogawa Ranpo. And in Japanese, it's a pen name. So in Japanese, Itogawa is a Japanese river, the Ido, and then Ranpo is random walk. So it's a random walk by the river is his name. But it's also a reference to Edgar Allan Poe. Because if it's Itogawa Ran Po, it's Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, no. And that's a fact, Jack. That's exactly what he was doing. Waggity wag, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was wild. But his stuff <laughs> was very bizarre. There was like erotic stuff, grotesque stuff, nonsensical stuff. Just an example of some of these detective stories. There was a man who kills his neighbor in a boarding house by dropping poison through a hole in the attic floor. What? And he was like hiding oh in the attic. Oh, my God. There was a guy who, <laughs> in one of these stories, a guy who hides himself in a chair just to feel the bodies on top of him. Oh. Just like weird well, we've all kind been there. of. <laughs> we've all wanted to do that. Hey, who? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not judging. <laughs> who are you judging? And then we go to, this is what probably we all know, is the hard-boiled crime, Sam Spade, Raymond Chandler, the American uh -huh. crime, noir stuff. The hard-boiled. Yeah. This is what <laughs> Jonathan Lethem, the writer is inspired by. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So now we go into him. He grew up in Brooklyn in the 70s, the author of this motherless Brooklyn. Oh, okay. And the oh, title- Well, I'm sure that's huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, there the, you go. The title carries a very personal reason to him because his really? mom died of a brain tumor when he was 13. <sighs> he even says, he's like, yeah, all of my books have something to do with memories being missing or someone gone. And that's the premise of Motherless Brooklyn is mm -hmm. it's this dude who's an orphan who gets taken in by this guy who's going through some shady dealings. Yeah. No spoilers since it's the inciting incident. He dies at the beginning and it's the, the whole mystery is who did it and, you know, like a classic mystery story. Yeah. But he's Jonathan Lethem up the pieces. Mm -hmm, has dealt with this from the very beginning and so this was a very personal novel for him. He went to art college in Vermont and then hitchhiked to California in 84 after he dropped out all the way across the country. That's great. And uh, he, right. so now he's living in California and he just is working at bookstores for like 12 years. His first book called Gun with Occasional Music came out in 1994. It's a detective book. Like oh. we said, that's what oh. it's about. But it's also got these crazy kind of sci-fi psychedelic elements. There's this talking kangaroo, cryogenics, these weird drugs. Like he's very heavily inspired by Philip Dick and Blade Runner and these Word. sorts of things. Okay. And he's and been- We are in the Blade Runner month, Taylor. <laughs> for all our listeners, it is November 2019. Is that when it's happening? Yeah. In the okay. Blade Runner. <laughs> Anyway, it's no yeah. longer a future film, which is odd. <laughs> that is odd. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, this guy is super into all the sci-fi stuff. He makes another book called As She Climbed Across the Table, which is about this physics instructor who falls in love with an artificial intelligence. Uh. He moves back to New York in 96 after being gone for so long. And then this is where he writes Motherless Brooklyn in 99 because mm. he's seeing the changes that are taking place. This Jonathan has no personal connection to Tourette's, which is what the main character is suffering with, but he learned about Tourette's from a literary work, a book, Oliver Sacks, an anthropologist on Mars, which is this profile of seven different patients. This guy was a neurologist. Oh, fascinating. Um, okay. Very prolific author as well. And so one of the profiles is about an artist who loses all sense of color in a car accident, but then finds creative power in black and white. There's one about an autistic okay. professor who can't deal with social exchanges, but then has a career about understanding animal behavior, which then we know now is Temple Grandin, oh. who's the lady who did the better slaughterhouses for cows and things, making them more... Really? Yeah, yeah. So this is... But there's one, which is an interaction with this guy, Carl Bennett, who was a surgeon who had Tourette's syndrome, who had these horrible tics, but they vanished when he was in the operating room. Oh, God. Because he was able to focus or whatever. Yeah. Jonathan Lethem read this, got super into this concept. Yeah. He rewatched this documentary called Twitch and Shout, which was made by a journalist who has Tourette's, was in the Emmy nominations for 1996. It was made by PBS. I'll post a link to the trailer okay. for yeah, it. Yeah. It seemed really, really good as well, like getting a profile of this is how these people do these things. And then he was saying, because he had lived in California for so long, he said, my style was more like a New Yorker. I was part of that low-level standing discomfort. I was like, I'm a little too loud. I'm a little too abrupt. I stand mm. too close to people. Mm -hmm. I gesticulate. He was like, I didn't feel like I belonged. I feel like I was over the top and lashing out when I was living in California because huh. I had this New York energy yeah. over there. Yeah. And then he said, as far as, because he loves detective books and noir, a huge part of detectives and characters in this world is verbal mastery. They might not be the, the biggest brutish guys. They might not be the smartest guys, but they're able to have their wits about them and mm -hmm. kind of talk themselves out of a situation. Mm -hmm. So what if there was a character where that was entirely flipped and they were the worst at that? How could they be a detective and figure stuff out right. and talk to people if they really can't? Then Edward Norton, here's where he comes in. Thank God. In 99, he's making Fight Club, <laughs> reads this book. Immediately, he's he's drawn to it. Um, yeah, he worked on it for a while, and they had tried to. Uh, he finally got it in a point where he wanted to make it all the way back in 2012. Mm -hmm. He had um, the script ready. Yeah, they wanted to do it, and then it was all just scheduling stuff, and then he got busy again, and then it like, gets pushed, and here we are, 2019. But yeah. finally, did get it done. I just love that he was just on it from pretty much from release and has been just wanting to do this. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it really is just a passion project. And, and there was a time, this is why I like Edward Norton from what I can see of him. Like he understands balance. There was a time in 2003 where he just stopped acting and was like, I need to get my head straight. And so he went and got his pilot's license and learned how to fly planes. And that took him seven months. I didn't know just that. Didn't do anything else. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he is very much aware of what's going on. And he's like, I would never put money into making movies. It's risky. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> He is completely empathetic. It's like, who's going to bet on me? He's like, I'm not the star that people are looking for to then put a bunch of money in. And he's like, oh yeah, this is like Rain Man, but in Chinatown. And it's like, nobody wants nah, that. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to make a bunch yeah. of money. Yeah. Uh, he's not, you know, he's not in a position where people are just going to green light anything he's in, anything he wants to do. I've got this movie I want to make, you know, it, you know, and, and as, as much as he is definitely ingrained in some, you know, just fantastic films that will be with us forever, that just does not mean it buys him infinite clout anywhere yeah. it's so fascinating that it's it's taken this long and he has made a movie before this as well i think it has been stiller in it mm -hmm. um, but it's a t it's a comedy it's like about yeah. a rabbi and a priest um like a bad joke yeah Start yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> so so I, I have not seen that but um it's totally different but mm -hmm. all the while you know like he, he, that was the first and only other thing he had really directed and kind of fabulous that he was able to get this on its feet and get it done, and especially in this fashion with this type of release. I mean, it's kind of yeah. just phenomenal to get it across the finish line like this. And you see all of the big actors and all the bigger names that are involved in it, and he will s say in these interviews, he's like, this was a passion project. This was every favor Everybody deferred pay. I ever had. Yeah, they, that means the actors did not get paid. They're getting paid on what the movie makes at the box office and later on down the line. This like, is... nobody made any money. Willem Dafoe did not get paid for the 46 days he was on set. 
all of these actors did not get paid. I mean, maybe the extras did and this and that, but like the big yeah, names yeah, yeah, that yeah. he that he called in favors for. They wanted got, to do they this don't need, for him. They, yeah, this was for Ed to do uh, something that he really believed in. And because they believe in him, they believed in it. Yeah. Um, it it's fantastic that everybody was able to come around it and mm-hmm. come around him. And uh, then, like we said, how the author, Ed went to him and was like, hey, I'm going to completely change this up. This is going to be set in the 50s because I think it'll work better in the visual language of film. Also, the plot's going to have to be entirely different because, you know, your book is set in the 90s. So that a lot of the thing revolves around like listening in on conversations and cell phones and you know that kind of stuff and it's like well that none of that can be in the in the right, in the right. story <laughs> these modern things so you've got to totally invent other other di- you know like, yeah. and you got to go I guess you got to do a ton of research I, I assume yeah. you know yeah uh, so what are what are dete- what were detectives doing <laughs> how were they actually finding people and keeping and getting tabs information on what was going and, yeah. on? absolutely and that's also what took a long time but Jonathan Lethem said in an interview, he was like, it's as if the book was a dream the movie once had and was trying to remember it. It's so <laughs> oblique a connection. He was super into it. He's like, yeah, go for it. Because Jonathan Lethem said that the plot of the book was an excuse to write the character. So he wasn't necessarily married to it. And that's also what Edward Norton was super into, which is why he wanted that's to make perfect, it. That's perfect, because the way I saw it, and based on just what I know about the book, which is in a, 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 a lot, mm-hmm. uh, it seems as if... Edward Norton took the the book as really the character, mm-hmm. the dynamic, the, you know, just to set up, just to get us in a place, you know, just a, a feeling, and then he matched that with something he was already interested in, which was the socioeconomic situation in New York in the 1950s, centering mm-hmm. around a, a particular uh, individual who was in a, in, in a really strange position of power, which yeah. we're going to get into. Yeah. So this is what a part of the reason that this took so long in the 2000s to write is Edward Norton's like, if I'm going to set it in here, it has to be about something going on in this time frame. And he said he got super fascinated by this guy, Robert Moses. And so just by pure happenstance, when I was reading this book, I was in the library and they have these like dollar bookshelves and I went and got this book for a dollar. And it's this book that after I read Motherless Brooklyn, I was like, oh, this is... And no, doing the no research, way. Like, this is what Edward Norton was talking about. It was this book that I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to read this at some point. But it's this massive book, 1,200-page monster magnum opus memoir about this guy that mostly people don't know about. But this book was written by Robert Caro in 75. It won the Pulitzer Prize for biography that year. Oh, Huge man. achievement. It's about this guy, Robert Moses, who basically from the 20s to the 70s is the real creator of – how New York City operates the and is architect. run. Yeah, he designed it's it. He bananas. every every public works project, every every it was thing basically a shadow every, government. Yeah, he was the fourth branch of the government of New York, and nobody could stop him. Nobody elected him. He, <laughs> nobody knew he was there. No, he had twelve titles in New York City at one time, all at the same time, including the Parks Commissioner. But like you said, he was never elected into office, and he just rose up and had so much power and influence. And he's a very controversial figure because this book paints him in a mostly negative light. So like he died in 81 mm. and he had written a 23-page statement denouncing the book when it came out in 75. Oh, really? Oh, fascinating. Yeah, because he slanders his name. Oh, I, wanna, um, I, wanna, I, I, I just didn't know he was in a, in, you know, in a position to actually – like that where he was challenged right, about it at right. all. Right, No, this was happening. I just kind of assumed he got away scot-free. <laughs> no. <laughs> for- yeah. I mean he did a ton of stuff that was also really good. But he was also really bad. So just some of the – like he favored highways, which helped create modern suburbs and spread that philosophy. And now that's like entirely what American infrastructure is based off of. Mm -hmm. This was what he was going from from the 20s to the 70s is like how do we build this infrastructure? He created numerous public authorities after the Great Depression, hosting the World Fairs. He's the reason the UN headquarters is in Manhattan is because of him. He created the Triborough Bridge, Shea Stadium, the Lincoln Center, like a lot of stuff. Yeah. The Lincoln Center is like one of the biggest arts places in the world. Like he did a lot of things for New York, but also at the same time, he was super racist. He was building things so that black neighborhoods could not get to them. He was not allowing access to certain things for certain people. He was... Pretty insidious. Pushing and pushing and pushing for a highway through Manhattan, which never got made. That was one of the few things that nothing came about in spite of all of his influence. 
I hope it broke his heart. No. <laughs> he tried to <laughs> he tried to have traffic come through Washington Square Park, which I'll link an article to Whoa. about. But I think that is something that does happen in the movie that Ed Norton puts in there. Yeah, that protest that's going on in Washington Square Park. That was a real thing. I mean, the way he paints all of this stuff is present in the film. They've changed the names because they add an mm-hmm. element to the character that is totally fictionalized. Yeah. That is just for dramatization and relates back to the main character that mm-hmm. Ed Norton plays. But they all of everything he just said about who Moses was is really present in this film. And from that standpoint, from what I understand, pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's played by Alec Baldwin, which is it's just a perfect choice. That's the one thing that is pretty amazing about this movie is because it was a labor of love, passion project mm-hmm. and they waited it out. They got everybody they wanted for every role. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, it's just perfect people in, in, in each position all the way around. But it's Alec Baldwin is this guy. And uh, I think say no more there. You know, it's pretty, yeah, yeah pretty yeah. perfect. Yeah. As far as this real guy, the, the like I said, the divisive nature of everything that happened. There was a, this governor elect uh, of New York that said a biography of Moses written today might be called At Least He Got It Built. Hey, you know, not bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's so much of where this character lands in the film. He kind of is forced to admit and confront a lot of, you know, a lot of the central plot of the film, but uh-huh. that almost exactly what you said is kind of morally where he lands. Mm-hmm. Um, so even that is is very much presented of, of, of who this guy was. So you can take out the dra- the dramatic elements of the plot here, mm-hmm. and I still think you're left with, like, an interesting look at somebody I don't think really anybody knows about really i don't know anybody my age has ever talked about him yeah i'll post a link but check out it's the the book is massive it would take you so long to read which i'm gonna so go through it over the course of a year you know like 10 pages a day but it's called the power broker and it goes through this guy's whole life and how just your power interesting at the end of the night yeah (laughs) uh what's today how did he do horrible Oh, oh, fantastic. World's Fair. Weird. Yeah, ah, yeah. an update. Oh, segregating. Oh, oh well. Yeah, just a, such a complicated person. So this is going back to our story about Edward Norton making this thing. He's putting all of this into this movie. He's changing it up. He's trying to get actors in line, trying to get money funded it's for alive. this thing. You know, it's alive. It's percolating. It's, it's, it's coming together. But he's pitching it to directors because he's like, I want to be the actor in it. I want to be the guy. I oh, wanna really? Be, I, I didn't know be, that. Okay. He's like, I want to be Lionel. So he pitched it to uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. He pitched it to David Fincher because they had a great relationship. Okay, But yeah. things were not coming together. He has a friend at the studio, which is now an executive at Warner Brothers, was the executive of New Line at the time. And he said, you need to direct this. And he said, brilliantly, this guy who is his friend is like, you know, he's like, Ed was like, this might have even been a lie at the time. But he was like... I think I'm going to get some other people to take a crack at this and mentioned a specific director that Ed Norton would be rolling over, you know, uh, if, yeah. if this guy got it yeah, or this yeah, gal yeah. got it or whoever it was. So he was like, well, we got to do this then if you're going to give it to that person. So he said he ended up writing a large bulk of the rest of the script in about two or three weeks. And this is wow. then what happened in 2012 where he's getting the ball yeah, rolling yeah, again. Yeah. Because his friend who was an executive was like, you know, if you, you don't really, really position it. Yeah. If you don't get to work on this, like as a friend, then I'm going to give it to this person. And he's like, you're not giving it to that person. Man. That Whether is that's lighting a fire. I yeah. mean, that's wild. But, that, but hey. What a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> Hell Yeah. Yeah. A big part of this producerial struggle then is integrating all of the elements of this movie because it's set in a time period piece, which is not cheap to make. Not at all. A lot of actors, a lot of moving parts. Shooting in New York City. Big part of it is the music. And that's another element. He's like, well, the... The The music is fabulous. The tone of the 90s book is going to be very different from the tone of a 1950s movie, but I still want it to feel a certain way. So he got Tom York of Radiohead to come up with this song. They had been friends because Ed Norton was at the first show of OK Computer in 97. I'll post a link. He's listed like on the private backstage guest list as a plus one for somebody else. Mm. So they had been friends since Radiohead was first coming about. Ah. So this is another Ed Norton getting everybody together, Good calling Lord. in all the favors. Yeah. He was like, hey, can you do this? No response. Two weeks later, he gets an email with the song. Oh, man. Like Tom York just made the song. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> did it. Yeah. yeah. A little something, what do you think? And it was beautiful. So he wants to then integrate this into the 1950s movie. So he gets Wynton Marsalis, who's the artistic director of jazz at the Lincoln Center, mm. to then come up with a jazz version oh, for fabulous. the actual diegetic in movie music. Mm-hmm. So it's the same song in the soundtrack and in the movie. Oh, wow. But both of their versions of it. And I'll post a link because it's on YouTube of the two different songs, and you can see the difference of how the guy from Radiohead would do it and the guy who's the head of jazz at Lincoln Oh, I had Center no concept of would this do it. at yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, besides all of that, the music of the film is such a, a strong element. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, I know that's not why anybody's here for the podcast, <laughs> but, but the, it's, as far as the film goes, it's such a strong element of yeah. this film, and I, I think that that is becoming a lesser and lesser revered and and mm-hmm. common thing is to just have great score. You know, mm-hmm. um, it really has a life and uh, a tone here that it really makes it pop. I think that the film would be lesser without it. Mm-hmm. And I don't really come away saying that about a lot of films. I really, really enjoyed the score re- just prominently in the yeah. theater while, while watching the film. Yeah. There was something from the book in relation to music where the main character who has Tourette's was talking about how he, and this is again set in the late 90s, how he gets by by listening to Prince because he thought that Prince's music was very Tourette's, meaning mm. having a lot of fits of starts and, and jolts and, and outbursts and things yeah. like that. And he references yeah, yeah, yeah. a song, Kiss, but the extended edition of that. So I'll post a link to that as well because the song is actually only three and a half minutes, but the extended edition is seven minutes and the last four minutes of it are just like crazy instrumentals and Prince shouting out and stuff like that. He was like, it really helped with his Tourette's because he could just go all out on listening to that song. So I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, if you're looking for some flavor of (laughs) of what the book was written on, I guess that's where to go. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And then as far as just other influences, because we said how Jonathan Lethem got into like portraying this character, mm-hmm. then Ed Norton has to come with something for his character. I got to I gotta commend this author. I don't I hate mm-hmm. to interrupt you. I just got to mm-hmm. commend this author for, and, and the author for Jojo Rabbit of just mm-hmm. being like, here, here was my story. This is just the story in mm-hmm. this version. Go do your thing. Make it into something else. Uh, that's how it lives. Mm-hmm. And, and I just think that's just beautiful uh, to embrace it and just see what happens. Mm-hmm. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just got to commend it for this. Both of those authors, yeah. on, on on something I think is uh, really admirable. Mm-hmm. But yeah, moving yeah, on. because he yeah because he was saying like as far as Ed Norton going into the understanding Tourette's, he was like it wasn't so much about how I'm portraying Tourette's because it's a grab bag and it's so unique to each individual person. It's like uh-huh. I don't want you to look at my performance and be like that's that looks like somebody who has Tourette's. He's like, it's more about how that person takes on the daily battles, taking responsibility, growing up, being in this position where you are just the underling of this person and now they're gone. And how do you move on? How do you deal with this? How do you solve your own problems Mm -hmm. and not just accept, hey, this is my situation. This is who I am. He's like, it was more about that than figuring out what looks like Tourette's. That's you know, he's cool. like, that's yeah. so, but he said, I, I was definitely in, in paying attention to just that aspect mm-hmm. of his performance during the film. And, and I have to agree at no point that it ever feel like it was some sort of imitation. Cause I think that's kind of the easiest fall mm-hmm. for, for it. And I, and he does particularly well. Yeah. There are a couple things that he has drawn from real life. So it seems like now we know a little bit about him. And if you're listening to this, it's like, I didn't really know. It seems like Ed Norton is like this undercurrent guy in Hollywood who just knows people <laughs> and is like calling in all the, you know, he's worked on he's a lot of skinny. stuff. He's the weird he's guy. Talking. He's, he's got that phone ring. He's putting it together when he's he wants it He's on the phone right now. Yeah. <laughs> probably. It's probably true. Yeah. He has a friend who is a corporate litigator in New York who has Tourette's. And he was saying that there's a thing in the in the movie where he does like this neck stretch thing and like pushing his jaw forward. And he's like, that's what my friend does. It looks like he's just has a crick in his neck, but it's a Tourette's tick. And so he pulled that. There's parts in the book where the character has to touch people on the shoulder. And Ed Norton really liked this because it was, it wasn't like a distancing gesture. It was a comforting gesture. It was like, I recognize you as a person. And so I have to touch you on the shoulder. And if there's, you know, the number is five today, he has to touch five people on the shoulder and that kind of thing. But Ed Norton was saying, there's a guy, his name is Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. He went to LSU with Shaquille O'Neal. He played in the NBA for a variety of teams and he retired in 2011 and he has Tourette's 
uh, again, I'll mm. post a link to a video about him, kind of like an ESPN doc. Um, but he does the shoulder touch thing as well, oh. like in games, oh, like man. when he's guarding people. It looks just like he's guarding people, but he's actually doing like the one, two, three taps. I did not know that. Yeah, so I assume I'm just late to the party. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Well, I didn't but know about that cool. guy yeah. either. But yeah, but like Edward Norton is seeing these things in other people in real life and like pulling from that as well as what was in the book. Very cool. Um, but I will say at the very, very end of the book, the last line of the book, which isn't spoiling anything, which I really, really thought encapsulated a lot and probably also encapsulated yeah. the movie was there's a line that the guy who dies, his mentor, says to him because he has Tourette's and because he's all over the place, the thing that he chastises him with, he's like, tell your story walking. He always has all these different like turns of phrase, you know, Brooklyn mm. turns of phrase. And that was the thing he said to him because he's like, yeah, keep moving. Like, <laughs> tell your story walking. Like, keep going. That's cool. And that's what the author who's in the first person, the Tourette's guy, he's like, after all this stuff happens, there's sort of a bittersweet ending to the whole thing. He says to the, to the reader, he's like, take a hike, you know, make like a tree and leaf and tell your story walking, oh, which cool. I think is a beautiful yeah. – positive end to be like yeah like move on from your it's like different from the detective novels that this guy has grown up with right Very, yeah. seeing of being like yeah the city is the way that it is it sucks and there's only so much you can do and at the end crime doesn't pay but it's still gonna come back and it's like no no, no you can like form something new yeah but you gotta keep that going then, tell your story now. don't stop yeah but keep walking absolutely um Oh, how how beautiful. And still, and still, even that, just that imagery is so, like, coincidentally mm -hmm. just lays right smack dab in the genre. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, just yeah. tell your story while I was like, what? It was, a, it, was a, it was a show on Queens, you know, yeah. pulling the collar up. Um, but yeah. the movie also beautiful. has that tone and air and flavor to it as well. Absolutely. Of I mean, take ownership you see outside of, in just yeah. the language even in that, because that's written from a 1998 perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That sounds like a noir, you uh -huh. know. It's it's yeah. so it's so in, the, in some ways must have been just begging to be mm -hmm. uh, translated and transported, transcomported, transcombobulated yeah. <laughs> into that. Yeah, <laughs> I enjoyed the film. Yeah. I gotta say, um, it's a little long, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I did see it. Really, I, I saw it late. You yeah, know, I yeah. saw it super late. But that's a, what it's. It's Ed Norton's thing. He said in interviews, he's like, I think there's a place for this. It's like a hearty meal, and like absolutely, people, people you watch, you binge watch a TV show, you watch nine hours straight of Orange is the New Black. It's like you can watch a two-hour, Oh, 100%. Two hour I, will, yeah. I will have this on in the background during the holidays. I uh -huh. will. I absolutely will. And it's got that look and tone and feel, all that kind yeah. of stuff, and it runs forever. It's one of those things that I'm, I will throw on in the background because mm -hmm. it's just got an interesting story. You're going to pick up different things in it here and there that, you know, yeah. every, every a rewatch, if you're so inclined, um, I, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I would definitely, it's one of those things where I wanted it to be over, but I, that at the very same time I wanted to, I couldn't wait for my next time to see it. Uh -huh. Um, cause I wanted to pick it apart more because it's one of those things where I just knew it's a little bit dense. It's a little long. I'm not going to get everything and that's, and that's not yeah. its fault. That is me. I've got, I'm taking well, also Ed my Norton, hit here. Ed Norton was saying, he's like, I watched L.A. Confidential. This is another thing he loved. And he's like, I don't remember what happens in that movie, but I know how <laughs> it made me feel and I know what it's about. Yeah. It's, like, it's about a detective and all this crazy stuff that's going on in this city. And he's like, that's what I got from it. Yeah. And like, yeah. that's the kind of movie that I wanted to make. So I think he succeeded in that if you felt that way, where you're like, I don't even remember what happened, but I was no, along that's exactly for the ride. How, yeah. That's kind of exactly. I mean, I remember what happened, but I, it's it, it seems like such a... It's not as loftly as something like Cloud Atlas, but yeah. like it has that feeling of like I've got to I've, I've got to return to this. Yeah, uh, different mindsets are going to open me up to a little bit different portions of it. It's not that cerebral. I don't want to overblow it and make it sound like yeah. it's some cerebral kind of Crazy like thing. yeah. No, yeah. it's not. It's not. But it's it's definitely. I think a hearty meal is a fantastic way to say mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that's and really check great. out the book. It's a lighter meal, but it's a it's a more personal first person. Check out the audiobook, especially. That sounds you wanna, dope. I want to yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, of course, check out all the links in our notes for all the stuff we talked about, all the videos and articles and whatnot. Hit us up at Illiterate Pod on Insta. Mm -hmm. uh, let us know what you're reading. Let us know what you're watching. Next week, we're doing Stephen King. Dr. Sleep. I've already seen it. I've Scary. already done my work. <laughs> Ta-da. A little preview. Got it. And the week after that, I can't wait. Ford versus Ferrari. We've got it all planned out. Yeah, I let us it. know what you want to see. Let us know if you yeah, want to. Yeah, if there's some, yeah, let us know. 
uh, what you're reading, what you're watching, and we'll see you all next week. Later. But I wasn't recording. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see the light. I'm just kidding. <laughs>